thank you so much for having me tonight, although I have to admit it's a kind of bittersweet thank you. Um, I'm so sorry to have to be here to talk about such a depressing topic, uh, the destruction of cultural heritage due to military conflicts in Syria, Iraq, Libya, uh, what has been called the greatest cultural heritage crisis since World War II. Um, yet, despite this very sad topic, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, as Ed said, I did teach at the University of Arizona in the late 1980s. I left in 1990. Uh, as many of you know, I left um, because I was not one of the people who could take uh, the heat of Arizona. Uh, so I moved to New Hampshire, where we don't have and uh, it was a great, great gift to be invited to come back and give this lecture tonight, uh, especially in the weekend in February, too. I'm also just really, really honored tonight uh, to uh, have been asked to give the lecture that memorializes Professor Raphael Patai. Uh, as Ed has said, I'm here tonight cultural heritage crisis in the Middle East, uh, but I am not a cultural heritage specialist. I'm not someone who earns my living by thinking about preserving, protecting, and restoring the Middle East cultural heritage. Um, I earn my living, as Ed mentioned, by being a religion professor and someone who specializes of ancient Israel, and especially ancient Israelite women's religion. Uh, like many who are in that field, uh, I have read and been deeply influenced by Professor Patai's work, uh, first on the ancient Israelite goddess the Hebrew goddess book that Ed mentioned, as well as his book, Family, Love, and the Bible. Uh, and it's just a really great honor to be to give a lecture that memorializes someone whose work I've read for so long and who I have admired so deeply, so, so much. But you should be asking, why is a specialist on ancient Israelite women's religion here to speak about the cultural heritage crisis in the Middle East? And the answer is that my work on Eastern cultural heritage crisis came upon me a little unexpectedly, beginning in 2014. So in 2014, in January of 2014, I became the president of the organization that Ed mentioned, the American Schools of Oriental Research. Uh, so I became the president of the American Schools of Oriental Research, or as we call it, ASOR the Gaping Wound Organization. Uh, but ASOR is an international organization whose membership is made up of archaeologists, of historians, of linguists, and of cultural heritage professionals whose mission, as you can see up here, is to initiate, to encourage, to support research into, and also the public understanding of the cultures and the history of the ancient Middle East and the wider Mediterranean which is to say, as we think of it as ASOR, uh, to think of that culture and history of the region that spans from North Africa in the west all the way to Central Asia in the east beyond the bounds of the map that I'm showing you here, and also spans in the north beyond the bounds of this map. Uh, we, are, we have members who work as far north as the Caucasus and members who work south of the Arabian Peninsula uh, in Yemen. Now, um, again, the map I'm showing you is a little bit abbreviated in terms of our cultural reach, but I think you can see that Syria sits pretty square in the middle of the territory members work, uh, as does the region of northern Iraq on, into which the Syrian conflict spilled beginning in 2014. So in 2014, it seemed obvious to me in my role as ASOR president that ASOR should respond to a request for proposals that had been put out by the U.S. 
Department of State, which offered the opportunity to enter into a cooperative agreement with the State Department to document what was happening to cultural heritage sites in Syria, beginning with the start of the Syrian Civil War in 2011, and also to document what had happened in northern Iraq as that conflict has spilled over from Syria into Iraq in 2014. So the, the goal was both to document what had happened to cultural heritage sites in the region and to plan as much as possible to carry out projects dedicated to the restoration, the preservation, and the protection of cultural heritage sites that had suffered damage during the conflict period. So it was obvious to me that ASOR should apply for this funding that was available for the State Department. To be completely honest, it was not at all obvious to me that we would be successful in getting this funding from the State Department. There were a lot of other fine applicants, and ASOR had never applied for funding of this particular nature and of this particular magnitude. But we were, against really my we were the successful applicant, and in August of 2014, we began working together with the Department of State on the Syria and northern Iraqi cultural heritage crisis. In 2017, three years later, we added Libya to our scope of work. Today, in the beginning of 2019, given that the conflict situations in northern Iraq and Libya have stabilized significantly, our efforts on behalf of the State Department are really now concentrated in Syria, although as I'll discuss in conclusion to my remarks tonight, we are doing some uh, work in especially Libya with the support of some other funding partners. But before I talk to you about what we're doing right now, I to tell you what we've learned between 2014 and today, and in particular what we've learned from the facet of our work uh, that we call monitoring, fact-finding, and reporting. This is the facet of the work that we've conducted in order to assess the current condition of cultural heritage sites in Syria, in northern Iraq, and in Libya. We have three major ways in which we collect information about what has happened to those cultural heritage sites. They're listed here, you fo here for you. One is to use high resolution satellite imagery. The second is to use um, essentially what's called here human source information. That means in country informants in State Department language. And third, to use um, open source information, which essentially means various media sources, including social um, media. And just to give you an example of what some of this looks like, I wanted to show you, for example, what we can do first with satellite imagery. Uh, so this, uh, this is imagery that comes from the Syrian side of Palmyra. I'll have more to say about it later on in the talk. But just for right now, you're looking at um, a, uh, the ruins. This picture was taken in 2005 of the so-called tetrapylon at Palmyra. Palmyra is a Roman era site. And I think you can see some very characteristic Roman architecture here with the columns and the pediments and all of this, oops, come back here, um, all of this kind of thing. Uh, this tetrapylon was destroyed by ISIS when it took the site of Palmyra, destroyed in January of 2017. And here is our satellite image of that. So here you can see what remains of the columns. Uh, I think you can see here um, the, the destruction in the center where the site was essentially blown up with explosives. Or here's another example. This also uh, comes from 2017. It comes from Syria in town of Raqqa. Uh, this was destruction that was caused by, probably by airstrikes or some kind of shelling uh, to a mosque in Raqqa. So you're looking down on a bird's eye view of the mosque. Here's the roof of the mosque and the dome of the mosque before the damage. And then you can see in the satellite image, here's that same roof now pierced in several places by explosives and damage to the dome also by explosives. Um, from this satellite. In terms of information we get from in-country informants, here's just an example of some of the kind of information we co collect. This is from northern Iraq. This is a report that came to um, 
via um, Kurdish Peshmerga forces in northern Iraq about Syrian, uh, excuse me, not Syrian, Assyrian antiquities from the ancient empire of Assyria that were beginning to show up um, just in the region of um, a Iraq, major ancient Iraqi city called Khorzabad. Um, and you can see here both a piece of statuary and a piece of writing from the ancient Assyrian material. Um, so the numbers of what we have done in terms of the information we've collected are kind of staggering, or at least they're staggering to me. We have inventoried, as you can see here, almost 16,000 different cultural heritage sites. These include archaeological, religious, and secular cultural sites, as well as museums, libraries, and historic districts. We have conducted close to 14,000 different satellite assessments of sites in this inventory and completed 750 detailed condition assessments and another 2,110 less detailed incident reports and made less detailed still about 5,000 different heritage observations. What this means is that ASOR has really created an unparalleled record of real-time conflict heritage degradation and destruction. And the materials that we have generated have been so important that they have been the subject of at least 260 separate news reports in the US and internationally over the last four and a half years. And that includes print reports, radio reports, social media reports, online video and podcast reports. We've presented the results of our investigations in congressional hearings to authorities at the UN and at the National Counterterrorism Center. Our data have been used to support the work of bodies as diverse as UNESCO, Interpol, and the UN Security Council's resolution monitoring team. And again, here's just the breakdown of the kind of sites we've been looking at, archaeological sites, religious sites, secular sites, museums, and overall, what our voluminous data have allowed us to estimate is that at a minimum, 2,053 cultural heritage sites in Syria, northern Iraq, and Libya have been destroyed or sustained significant damage between August 2014 and December 31st, 2018. The largest majority of these by far is in Syria. 1,525 different Syrian sites cataloged through December 31st, 2018. 480, 448, excuse me, northern Iraqi sites and seven Libyan sites. The causes of the damage are multiple, but I'm going to divide them for you into roughly three categories. If you look at the left-hand side, um, the major patterns of damage, the major cause of damage uh, has been due to military activity. Military activity explosives, military activity airstrikes, military activity intentional destruction, military activity gunfire, and so on and so forth. So the major causes of the destruction are due to military activity and especially due to um, uh, explosions and airstrikes, and this is particularly the case in Syria. This chart is the Syrian data only, and you can see here uh, explosives is at the top line, airstrikes is the second line. Dramatically um, uh, visualized, I hope for you here, about the nature of these um, activities caused by explosions and airstrikes. Again, let me just show you a couple of examples. The first one comes from the very beginning of ASOR's work in Syria at the United, uh, United uh, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site of Aleppo. Uh, if any of you happen to know Aleppo, uh, you know that Aleppo uh, has a old, beautiful citadel in the center of the city that dates back uh, into, um, uh, for at least millennia. 
uh, a, the picture you're looking at at the top is a satellite image from February 2014. At the bottom, you're looking at damage that was caused by tunnel bombs that were put at the base of these walls of this walled citadel. And so this damage in December that came in 2014 by this series of tunnel bombs. The damage was extensive. Um, there were several mosques that were destroyed, several madrasas, a 14th century haman or a traditional Middle Eastern bathhouse, and the 16th century covered market, one of the real um, signal uh, uh, signature cultural heritage sites of Aleppo. Here's the view of it from the ground, but maybe you can still see all this destruction at the base. Here's the walls here and the destruction at the base of the walls. More recently, about a year ago in January of 2017, we were devastated by reports of the destruction of an ancient temple, a temple that dates from the time of Solomon at the site of Ain Dara in northwest Syria. This destruction was caused by airstrikes from Turkish fighter planes who were engaged in Turkey's military operations against the Kurdish troops in Syria's Afrin uh, province. You're looking here at the temple before for destruction. So you, um, you can see here, at least I hope you can maybe see here, the walls, the remnants of the walls of the temple, the platform of the temple. After the destruction, this is from exactly the same corner. You can see all the rubble, or I hope again you can see the rubble and the destruction. Here from a slightly different view, looking from the other side, but the rubble that came after the bombing, or a view that is particularly um, moving to me. This was before the destruction. These are the staircase into the with this winged, beautiful carving of a winged sphinx guarding the stairs. Here's what that looks like today. Here are the stairs, the sphinx, presumably, somewhere in that um, debris. So after destruction that is caused by explosives and caused by airstrikes, the second most common cause of damage to cultural heritage has been damage that is caused by looting and theft at archaeological sites. Uh, here's again on the chart, uh, you can see illegal excavations here falling fifth on the chart for all the sites in Syria northern Iraq and Libya. If we isolate Syria, in Syria in particular, the results of illegal excavations jump to third on the chart, as this has been a particularly a problem in terms of Syrian cultural heritage. Now, some of this looting, and in the grand scheme of things, the least harmful, is small scale, it's localized, it's individualized, and it's opportunistic looting. That is, it's guys who are going out, and it is guys, who are going out with a metal detector, you can see the metal detectors down here, to local archeological sites uh, and using the metal detector to locate predominantly coins, sometimes pieces of jewelry, which they can then dig up with a shovel and sell on the antiquities market. And this is often done for completely understandable reasons, like men who are trying to support a family in a region where the economy has collapsed because of the nature of the conflict. Now there is um, damage here from an archeological and scholarly perspective. The looted objects it's themselves are often lost to the scholarly community. They're often bought by private collectors and not available for study by scholars. Even if scholars do have access to this looted material, the key questions that archeologists like to ask of their discoveries are unable to be asked. Was a piece of jewelry found in a tomb, for example, or in an ancient home? That tells us something different. Uh, it tells us something if it's found in a tomb about what burial customs might have been in that society versus if it's found in a home. But if it's simply looted, the answers to those questions are lost. 
That said, the damage that is caused by this kind of small scale opportunistic looting is minor compared to the industrial scale looting that has really destroyed major archaeological sites, especially from the Roman and the early Islamic era. I'm showing you on the map here the location of the site of Apamea, which is in northwestern Syria. This is a site that was founded in 301 BCE, shortly after the conquest of Alexander the Great. And it was then occupied for another millennium or so throughout the Hellenistic period, the Roman period, and then the late Roman period until it was finally abandoned until in the year 614 of the Common Era. Until 2011, Apamea was one of the best preserved Roman era cities anywhere in the world. Yet between July of 2011 and April of 2012, about two thirds of the site was intensively looted by what have been reported to be armed gangs using bulldozers to dig a trenches some um, five meters on a side and again this is taken from a local informant screenshot so it's a little blurry but here's one of these enormous trenches that you can see or I hope you can tell is has been dug at the site this is not a small a guy digging with a shovel some small hole to pull out um, some coins evidently the point of diggers uh, was to uncover mosaic floors that can then be extricated from their setting and sold on the antiquities market. Pits of up to 20 meters deep have been reported throughout the site in the floors of temples, in the floors of churches, and in the floors of bathhouses. Now this is just a much different matter than small holes dug with shovels when someone hears a ping on a metal detector. Come to cover almost two thirds of the entire site. So what you're looking at here is in the upper left hand corner, this is the site before the outbreak of the Syrian civil war. So um, the site is roughly bounded here. These are privately owned fields over here and then the site is roughly bounded here with the major Roman road running sort of north-south directly through it. A year later, by April 2012, what we are seeing is a site where all of a sudden you see all these little dots here, or the close-up here. Those are the pits. Those are the bulldozed pits, the pits that are up to three to five meters wide and pits that are up to 20 meters deep. And as you can also see here by November of 2013, the pitting, the looting, the bulldozing has extended beyond the original boundary of the site, which ran somewhere around here, now into what we're excavated fields. Archaeologists estimate that from a scholarly point of view, Apamea as a site of research has effectively been destroyed. And we might ask as well about Apamea as a site as a tourist destination. Before the Syrian civil war, it was one of the most popular tourist sites in Syria. And we need to ask the same uh, question about the future of archaeology and the future of tourism at other Syrian sites where this large-scale looting has taken place. For example, the Hellenistic and late, late Roman era city of Dura Europus in far eastern Syria. Uh, here is what some of the pitting looks like at that site. This is the close-up of what's in the oval here and all of these little dots again, represent large-scale industrialized bulldozed um, looting. Also of concern throughout much of 2014, 2015, and 2016 was the Islamic State's program that facilitated the looting of archaeological sites. More specifically, before the second half of 2017, by, by the second half of 2017, ISIS really had lost any meaningful holdings in Syria and northern Iraq. But when ISIS still held major swaths of territory in 2014, 15, and 16, ISIS um, engaged in a program of looting. Um, first, a program where ISIS itself looted. So you're looking here at an object 
object that was found held by an ISIS militant in northern Syria. But ISIS also used local looters as part of their administrative control. Indeed, what you're looking at here are receipts that were issued by ISIS because ISIS required in territory it held all local looters to pay a 20% tax on what they looted and sold. And that 20% tax came to ISIS as proceeds that ISIS then used for its um, military activities. And these proceeds are significant. Uh, in May of 2017, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that these proceeds from just taxing looters were estimated to be in the range of $88 million a year. So this is a program of um, permitted looting. Now that's an oxymoron, uh, but this is a quite aggressive program of poor permitted looting, and it's a quite um, um, a ruthless program of permitted looting. So what you're looking at in this chart is just data from Syria, and it's just data from 2014 and 2015. But when we look at ISIS-controlled areas in Syria and look at the kind of looting that was taking place, what I want to draw your attention to is the degree to which ISIS in particular was responsible for that large scale industrialized looting, what is characterized here as heavy looting, as opposed to the guys with metal detector characterized here as minor looting. So the ISIS program is really um, quite of a different magnitude and a different scale. ISIS, moreover, is responsible not just for causing damages to cultural heritage sites through a program of sanctioned looting, much better known, and I suspect most of you know, is ISIS's role in what I would categorize as the third major cause of the destruction of cultural heritage. And it's what's shown as third here on this list. This is military activity intentional destruction. And this is particularly true of the territories ISIS held in northern Iraq. So when we look at Iraq alone, you can see at the very top of this chart is military activities by intentional destruction. That is intentional instruction of cultural heritage sites on ISIS's part. And again, I suspect many of you are quite aware of this. Many of you may have seen, for example, this video that ISIS released in February of 2015 that shows attacks on the Mosul Museum. ISIS had, had seized Mosul about, I don't know, eight months earlier in June of 2014 and then released this video in February of 2015 of their destruction in the museum. And the Mosul Museum held material particularly from the ancient empire of Assyria, which was centered in the northern part of modern-day Iraq, uh, along especially the banks of the Tigris River. Um, modern Mosul is about right there. Um, the Mosul Museum also held material from the uh, Roman-era site of Hatra, which is a UNESCO World Heritage uh, Site. But ISIS's treatment of this material was to throw statuary to the ground. Uh, to smash the statuary with sledgehammers, to attack other pieces of statuary. These are um, famous human-headed colossi that came from the ancient um, Assyrian site of Nineveh, to attack these with jackhammers to chisel away the face of these beautiful statues, which looked at discovery, something like this, and before ISIS got a hold of them, something like this. Many of you may have seen these. They're held in many museums around the world, famously in this country, in the Metropolitan um, Museum. Shortly thereafter, in early March 2015, reports began to circulate that ISIS had moved heavy construction vehicles and other equipment into the 
city of Nimrud, which is about 30 kilometers south of Mosul, and that a road had been cut through the city. Um, ruins. So Nimrud was the capital city of the ancient Assyrian king Ashur Nasser Paul II, who ruled from 883 to 859 BCE. As you can see here, I hope you can see here, Ashur Nasser Paul city was huge. It covered about 890 acres. It was surrounded by a mud brick wall that was 7.5 kilometers long. And there was then an inter inner walled citadel in the southwest that uh, was about 60 acres in size. In that inner walled citadel, Ashur Nasserpal built his palace, what's today called the Northwest Palace. This is a reconstruction from the Metropolitan Museum of what the Northwest Palace may have looked like. It was a huge building, at least 20, excuse me, at least 200 meters by 120 meters in size. It was all built of mud brick, except for the lower parts of the inner walls, which were lined with stone slabs. So I don't know how well you can see this here, but this is a view of the site taken in 2009. You can still see some of its mud brick remains. Uh, this perhaps clearer, you can see some of the mud brick remains of the site. Here's one of the entryways into um, the palace, the mud brick here, and then the stone slabs that covered the mud brick down below. And in the interior, elaborately carved stone slabs um, that um, today are held by many of the world's major museums and indeed some of its more minor museums like the museum at my own institution where we hold six of the slabs from the palace of Ashur Nasser Paul II at Nimrud. Total, there are attested about um, there are attested about 575 of these slabs, of which about 45 percent, 261 fragments and slabs, remained on the site at Nimrud. Here's um, some of the imagery of that taken in 2009. You can see the slabs remaining on site here. Uh, perhaps here you can also see again from 2009 the slabs that remained on site at Nimrud. But in early of March 2015, as I mentioned, reports began to circulate that Nimrud was being attacked by ISIS. And then in April of 2015, ISIS released a video showing deliberate destruction of the reliefs followed by destruction of the entire site. So here is, here's the satellite photo that shows the road that's to be built into the site in March of 2015. Here are images from the video that ISIS released in April of 2015 of its destruction of the site, again attacking these reliefs with sledgehammers, as here, here, tearing them apart, throwing them to the ground, gathering them with bulldozers and piling them up outside, jackhammering away the imagery, and then finally lining up against the remaining reliefs a series of bombs, uh, of barrels filled with explosives, so-called barrel bombs. You can see the fuse that ties them together here, and then the site was exploded before explosion, 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 and what remains in terms of debris at the site today. From the satellite, we can see here, this is before the destruction. You can see the major structures are still in place here after the destruction. Everything is gone. 
Shortly thereafter, in May 2015, ISIS took control of the ancient site of Palmyra in Syria, near the modern-day town of Tadmor. Uh, Palmyra is another remarkable archaeological site. It thrived in the Roman period between the first and third centuries, when it was really an economic powerhouse because it lay along a major east-west trade route that linked the Mediterranean to India and all the way to China. It was also a cultural center where influences from the Greco-Roman West intersected with the Persian influences from the East. It was added to the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1980. It's a city that had a wealth of ancient monuments. You can see on this map here how many we are talking about, including notable temples, including the Temple of Baal, a colonnaded street that land, ran for approximately 1.2 kilometers through a monumental arch and then up to the tetrapylon, which I mentioned um, before. It had a beautiful theater uh, and other notable structures. Again, here's the tetrapylon, here's the theater, uh, here is a small temple dedicated to the god Baal Shamim. Here is Isis's treatment of the small temple dedicated to the god Baal Shamim. Or here from the satellite picture, here's the before. You can see the temple clearly in place here. Here's the destruction afterwards where um, essentially the temple has blown up. The ditto damage to the other temple are the temple of Baal. Uh, here is the before picture. But from the satellite imagery, we can see here's the temple before. Here's the satellite imagery that shows the damage after Isis's taking of the site. Um, ISIS also posted a video that showed itself smashing statuary from the site, as you can see um, here. But it's important to note, and, and really important to note, that ISIS also published photographs in June of 2015 depicting the destruction of Islamic shrines near Palmyra. That's what you are seeing here. These were shrines dedicated to revered figures of this Islamic community's past. And in fact, despite all the attention that ISIS's destructive acts at sites like Nineveh and Nimrud and sites like Palmyra have garnered in Western media and the attention that I've given them here, ISIS's destructive acts have been much less direct directed towards these ancient sites and much more directed to late antique, medieval, early modern, and even modern religious sites. So here's again destruction of the shrines near Palmyra. But you can see on this chart here, and this is just data from one year, from August 2014 through August 2015, of ISIS destructions. Here's the destructions of ancient sites and really 8% we're talking about, whereas the other part of this pie chart is showing you ISIS's destruction of religious um, sites in the territories that it had seized. This chart is showing you the same thing, just in a slightly different way and with data that spans a longer time span. It's particularly notable, I think, if you look at a rock here at the center. The blue bar is for destructions of ancient archaeological sites. The red bar is for destruction of more modern, or medieval at least, religious sites. Or even here, which is just destruction that ISIS um, wreaked in Mosul, if you look at the greatest areas of destruction, which are down here on the western bank of the Tigris, and just look at what you're seeing here, we're looking at a destruction of a tomb, we're looking at a destruction of a church, we're looking at a description of a shrine, of a mosque, of a mausoleum, of another mosque, of another church, this pattern of just violent, violent destruction of religious sites on ISIS's 
um, part. Um, it is not hard to fathom the reasons for this. Um, ISIS, as you all probably know, is a Sunni Muslim group that follows a particularly conservative interpretation of Islam, either called either Wahhabi or Salafi Islam, which holds that to show reverence to any being other than the one God of Islam is understood to be idolatry. So Christian churches are clearly, therefore, problematic, but also problematic are Islamic shrines, Islamic tombs, Islamic mausoleums that commemorate saints or other notable religious leaders, especially saints and notable religious leaders from the Shia tradition. And these have been destroyed over and over and over again by ISIS on the grounds that these are sites of idolatrous worship. But there's even something more going on here, as we can see if we consider the first destruction that ISIS undertook uh, in, when it took the city of Mosul in June of 2014. Shortly thereafter, a month after, on July 24th of 2014, um, ISIS destroyed the shrine called the Mosque of Nevi Yunus, or the Shrine of Nevi Yunus. Eunice. Now, this mosque in, had originally been a church, and it's a church with deep historical roots, dating back even perhaps to the 7th century. Perhaps already at that time, perhaps later, and you're seeing a close-up of it here, wine had been a, become associated with the prophet Jonah. And that's because in the biblical story of the prophet Jonah, Jonah is said to have been told by God to leave the land of Israel and go at once to Nineveh in northern Iraq, the great city, and prophesy there to the people of Nineveh, saying that the city is going to be destroyed. Now, in fact, in the book of Jonah, it has a happy ending. The city is ultimately not destroyed. But because Jonah is associated with Nineveh, or modern-day Mosul, this shrine became associated with the prophet Jonah, first as a church dedicated to Jonah, but then, once Islam took over, as a shrine dedicated to Jonah, as Islam inherited from its Jewish and Christian forebears a reverence for this prophet. But for ISIS, a mosque that shows reverence to any but the one God of Islam is idolatrous, and so the shrine became a target for destruction. But the other thing that is going on here, and that I think it's very worth us thinking about, is that a shrine that was part of the heritage of both Christians and Muslims was something that helped unite and create community for the populations of Mosul. It brought different segments of the Mosul religious community together. But creating community across religions, the Islamic majority and the, and the Christian minority, was not something that ISIS wanted. The goal of their so-called caliphate was an exclusively Muslim state and an exclusively Sunni Muslim state governed by Wahhabi principles. So it's no coincidence that at precisely the time that ISIS is destroying the shrine of Nevi Yunus, the shrine that helps unify Muslim Christian and Muslim population, that ISIS also begins attacking the Yazidi minority, religious minority, in the Sinjar province in northern Iraq. Again, this minority religious population is also for ISIS threatening and stands contrary to their agenda of a Sunni alone Islamic caliphate. Paradoxically, what that means is that ISIS's destructive acts show us something profound about cultural heritage. As ISIS's impulse to destroy cultural heritage associated with communities other than their own shows how fundamental a role cultural heritage can play in bringing diverse members of a community together and helping them live productively side by side. 
shared ownership and shared pride in sites like the Shrine of Nevi Yunus, that is, while they can hardly solve all the problems of a deeply fractured and sectarian Iraq, can help. They can help as the cultural heritage of ancient sites like Hatra, like Nineveh, like Nimrud can help by offering all Iraqis a way of feeling proud of their long ago past. Just as sites like Apamea, Dura Europus, Palmyra, Aleppo, Ein Dara, and the other sites that have been destroyed in Syria all can give Syrians a past they have in common even as today's ethnic and political differences threaten to tear these communities apart. When I think about this, I think that if today's war-term communities in Syria and Iraq are someday to heal, and I fervently hope this will happen, that Syria and Iraq's rich and multifaceted cultural heritage can serve as one tool that can help this healing to happen. And that's why at ASOR we have been concerned not just with the destruction of cultural heritage, but with projects we might do in terms of cultural heritage restoration. And I want to close by giving you just a couple of examples. The first example comes from the Syrian city of Raqqa. Uh, and in Raqqa, we have worked in terms of restoration to the Raqqa Museum. So the Raqqa Museum is a museum that, had su that has suffered badly during uh, the war. It's a very small museum. It had a very small collection. But nevertheless, in 2013, ISIS looted the museum's collections and shipped the artifacts to Turkey to be sold uh, illegally. In 2014, explosives were detonated near the museum causing um, damage. So here is the museum before the conflict. Here is the museum, as you can see, in 2017. You can see all the damage from the explosives here. Uh, here even more so, you can see the damage to the outside of the museum. And then you can see just the complete rubble uh, as, as the interior had been completely stripped and looted. Uh, nevertheless, we were able just this past year working together with a cultural heritage organization called Vision, and here we are over here, to help in a rehabilitation of the project of the museum, to restore the front facade of the museum, and also to clean up the interior of the museum. Uh, it's not that the museum's collections have come back. These have all been dispersed. And it's not that the museum is ready to reopen. Nevertheless, to bring back this cultural symbol of Raqqa so that someday the museum might be back seems to us a step in a more positive direction. The other example I would give you is from Libya and work that we have done in uh, Benghazi. Uh, so work that we have done uh, in Benghazi and especially the historic city center of Benghazi, trying to assess the degree of cultural damage there and think about um, restoration. This is a map we did just using satellite data of what we thought about the destruction that had taken place in Benghazi. But satellite is, data is no substitute for on the ground actual um, assessment. And so we were able to bring a team from the Historic Cities Authority in Benghazi to Tunis uh, and in Tunis, train them to use handheld wireless tablets and a GPS system to go around and essentially look at site after site and on their handheld unit document the kind of cultural damage that had taken place. Here's the kind of report that was generated with these handheld units by the Historic City Authority's staff in Benghazi. Or here's another example here, this one focusing on this particular cinema that was a quite famous cinema before the conflict. Here's what it looks like before. Here's what it looks like um, today. Our colleagues in Benghazi have 
have used this data uh, to be able to ascertain what would be their highest priorities for restoration, and they've identified two different buildings, the so-called Egyptian Club and the former U.S. consulate. This is not the consulate you are thinking of. This is an even older U.S. consulate. This is not the consulate that was the site um, of the um, hostilities in Benghazi. But they have used this data from their assessment um, in order to um, figure out where they want to go next. And then finally in Libya, we have been able to work with the local Boy Scouts and Girl Guides, um, which is a kind of project near and dear to my heart because I work with youth all the time. Uh, the project in Libya is first to use um, uh, teachers from the Department of Antiquities to, to teach local scouts on archeological sites about the value of the sites, both through presentations as you're seeing here, but also by actually having them work on the site as here in a mock excavation that the Department of Antiquities set up. This little scout is actually finding a pot, which is really, really cute. But even um, helping clean up the site, to clean up the mosaics at this site of Cyrene, which is a richly Roman site with beautiful mosaics so that the mosaics are now better able to be visited. The scouts then invite their families, their neighbors, their communities to come see the work they have done in what are called pop-up museums where they essentially no. Uh, essentially put a tent up on site and put up a small scale museum display um, showing what they have learned, the work they've done, and trying then to use that to educate their families, their communities, and their neighbors about the value of this cultural heritage. I don't pretend, again, that this is going to solve all the problems of the Middle East, all the manifold problems of the Middle East. But if there's one thing I could hope you would take away uh, today from my talk, it is to say that while the damage has been catastrophic, the tide is slowly turning from conflict-related destruction to opportunities for conservation and restoration. And I hope that allows us to look to a somewhat happier future. We at ASOR are very proud we're able to contribute to this through our work and through our members' expertise in these efforts. Thank you.